Let's all stand together and sing a new name written down in glory. And I'm glad to say it's mine. I was once a sinner, but I came pardon to receive from my Lord. This was really given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine. And the white robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home For there's a new name written down in glory And it's mine, oh yes it's mine With my sins forgiven I was dead forever Never more to roam I was humbly kneeling at the cross Hearing not but God's angry frown When the heavens opened And I found That my name was written down There's a new name Written down in glory And it's mine Oh yes it's mine And the white book Angels sing the story A sinner has come home for there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes it's mine, with my sins forgiven I am not for heaven, never more to roam. In the book tis written, saved by grace, oh the joy that came to my soul. And I know by the blood I am made whole. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And the white robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home. For there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, never more to roam. Well, good evening. Welcome to the house of the Lord on this Sunday night. It's good to see this crowd here. Amen. And we appreciate you being with us. We're going to highlight a bunch of our youth tonight, having youth night since this is the fifth Sunday night of the month. Brother Joseph's got some of these young navigators going to sing. We're going to sing our youth choir, have a special during the offertory. It is good to be in the Lord's house, and uh, Brother Joe is kicking off a meeting for Brother Paulie tonight, so we want to remember him in prayer. Remember Brother Doug Scott tonight up in the hospital. God will touch him in a mighty way, but it is good to be in God's house. Say amen. It is such a thrill to be with God's wonderful people. God's been good to us. What a wonderful morning we had. Good preaching of the Word of God. Looking forward to Brother Chris preaching here in a little while. And we're just uh, thankful for the goodness of God. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Ask God to meet with us. And let's pray. Brother Daniel Spiva, would you lead us to the Lord in prayer? Man, you may be seated. Uh, this is Youth Night. Going to let Brother Joseph come here in just a minute and introduce these young people from the Navigators group that will be singing for us. And we're excited about everything God's doing for us. Uh, now, Brother Joseph, uh, June 19th, will be taking a group of uh, these Navigators down to Brother Greg Lent's camp down in Bautista, Georgia, Lake Park, Adventure of Faith. And then the very same week, uh, Brother Tom and Miss Beth be taking the Youth for Truth, a bunch of teenagers to Pensacola Christian College for Teen Extreme. And so uh, Brother Joseph's going to go suffer in the heat. Miss Beth and I are going to go suffer in the heat and have a great time with a bunch of young people. Brother Joseph, how many do you have going? 12. 
12 going with Brother Joseph, and I am taking uh, 38 teenagers, the most we've ever taken to camp. And uh, I I'm, I'm think I'm going to recruit some other moms and dads to go, amen, so I don't pull my hair out. I want to keep my hair even though it's gray. But uh, uh, we are, we're looking forward to a great time. So let me say this. You can sponsor one of these Navigator young people to go to camp, one of the Youth for Truth young people to go to camp. For $100, you can help send them to camp and be a blessing. We have several families in the church with more than one child. And my prayer and my goal is that you, the church, would get involved and help us sponsor these young people. I would like to see our parents only have to pay for one child to go to camp. And uh, those that have two and three children, that we could help bear that burden a little bit. So if you'd like to help uh, pay for one of these young people to go, see Brother Joseph, see myself or Miss Beth, we'd love for you to help these young people. And uh, we want to highlight and let them be seen tonight. Aren't you glad there's still a church behind us coming up? Amen. And this is, this is not our church of tomorrow. This is the church of today. And we need these young people. And uh, I'm thankful for a church with a vision, a pastor with a vision. And all that this church pours into young people. Beth and I have been here almost 18 years, uh, the first Sunday of June. And all that this church and this, this ministry has poured into the lives of young people and our youth ministry, I'm so thankful to see God working and moving. So, Brother Joseph, you come on. We'll let these navigators go first. Tom can brag about his 18 years. I've been here 35, so <laughs> what do you think about that? So, But we are so thankful, especially for the Children's Home Offering in India. This morning, before the offering, we were, we were over $2,600, and I'm pretty sure we surpassed the $3,000 mark. And a few, yes, so thank y'all. So, and I've already had two sponsorships given me uh, for the junior camp, and we appreciate that very much. Uh, we do have several families that we're taking all their children away. I don't know what they're going to do, So, but they have no kids at the house. But we're going to start off this evening with a duo, a duet, sorry. Watch Batman growing up. So this is a duet. It's brother and sister, Mr. R.J. and Miss Hallie. Guys, when you're done, you can go ahead and make your way back to your seats, all right? We got a trio. We've never had this before. We've had solos and we've had duets, but we've never had a trio. So, Jamila, Emira, James, y'all make your way over there. This is a trio we have. This is Emira, James, and Jamila. Thank you. 
have a solo, Miss Maddie. Miss Maddie's going to sing a solo for us. phrase we rehearse with the kids in class sometimes just because you're the only one doesn't mean you're alone y'all say that with me now please just because you're the only one doesn't mean you're alone and I may be a little biased here on this next one but this is Miss Michaela Yeah. 
big enough We'll finish everything he starts He'll meet us right here where we are I can feel things rising up Cause I know God is big enough Bigger than the fear that surrounds me Bigger than the chains that bound me Bigger than the story a past can tell Bigger than the way that tomorrow Bigger than the hurt and the sorrow Bigger than the lies I've told myself So when it seems it can't be done God is big enough I can run the race I'm called to run Cause I know God is big enough We'll finish everything He starts He'll meet us right here where we are I can feel things rising up Cause I know God is big enough That's a blessing I have almost every day. Usually starts about 6 a.m. <laughs> so I know she's awake because she's going through the hallway singing. So now we have our next uh, soloist here. This is Miss Rachel. Miss Rachel. Tony the Tiger, the Frosty Flakes, they're more than good, they're great, not like the guy who advertises junk food, the tiger that advertises junk food, the scrawny, skinny one that's just cheesy all the time, he's not great like Tony, all right? <laughs> now, we have our last solo here for this evening for the Navigators, this is Mr. Holcomb, also known as the Drummer Boy.
Praise the Lord. That does my heart good to know there's some uh, more choir members coming up. Amen. Uh, what a wonderful job Brother Joe and Miss Macy have done, and I appreciate all the work they put into your children. We ought to give them a hand. Somebody came to me right before church started and said, Brother Joe wasn't kidding. I just saw Brother Joseph tell them boys to sit down and shut up. Uh, I can tell you this, Joseph and Macy love your kids. And they pour their life into them. It's a blessing. Uh, we're going to have an offering. We've got a mother-daughter duet to play for our offertory tonight. And if you men will get ready and come on, we'll take our offering. And then uh, we'll stand together and sing a little chorus, allow the youth choir to get up in their place after this. And uh, Brother Chris, you make your way up here in just a minute. Brother Barrios, will you come lead us to the Lord in prayer over this offering? Appreciate Brother Barrios and our Spanish ministry, their faithfulness. Saturday after Saturday, they're out there winning their community and reaching souls for the glory of God. Appreciate your faithfulness all these years. Brother, pray for us. Yes, sir. Our prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you, Jesus, for, thank you for your presence. Thank you for the wonderful love that you have for us, Lord Jesus. Thank you for a pastor, for a church, for the souls that have saved all this week, Lord Jesus. Bless the all for some time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Praise the Lord for the talent here at Harvest, all those that are a part of it, and uh, praise the Lord for our adult choir. I love the I love the choir. I love being a part of that, and uh, praise the Lord for these young people. I, young people, y'all come on, make your way up. Can we stand together? Can we do? I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. Uh, the lily of the valley while these young people make their way up. I have found a friend in Jesus. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort. He's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my. He will never, never leave me. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. Of all the fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face Where rivers of delight shall ever roll He's a lily of the valley, the bright and morning star He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul Thank you, you may be seated, thank you for being here tonight all right, all the moms and dads and grandparents that had uh, one of these young navigators participate. Let's stand and see all the proud moms and dads and the grandparents in the audience. Amen. Uh, from the navigators, all right. All right, if you have a, a Youth for Truth singing here tonight, y'all stand too. I know the proud parents. I want to say I'm very proud of these young people. I know on Wednesday nights when we are working on youth choir songs, I know who wants to sing and who doesn't want to sing, and, uh, but I'm very proud of these young people being willing to, to worship the Lord and sing and give God glory, and uh, it's not about uh, always how we sing, but it is about the heart of, the heart of worship that we have, and uh, I just want to say I'm probably one of the oldest youth pastors in all the state of Georgia, but I sure love this, and I want to say thank you to you moms and dads for trusting us. And letting us have a part. Thank you to Brother Joe for letting us carry on with this youth ministry and uh, try to pour our lives into these young people. Uh, and I'm praying, Brother Don, I'm praying God will send one more spark of revival in this land. And boy, I'd love to see God start it right here at Harvest in these young people. And I appreciate you parents, appreciate this church. Can you pray for these young people while we sing?
You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. go down. Has God been good to you? Better to us than we deserve. God's so faithful. He's always on time. Matter of fact, the psalmist David said uh, he's right early. He's right early. So when you think he's four days late, he's on his time and it's always early on his time. Uh, he's never let you down. God is good. God is great. Love these young people. Thank you young people. Such a good job. Thank you, Brother Joseph, Miss Macy, all the young navigators. Such a wonderful time to be able to hear these young people sing. And uh, this is the future, Harvest Baptist Tabernacle. And we're going to keep pouring our lives into them. Amen. Brother Chris, come on up here. Uh, Brother Chris and I got to work together a little bit with and Joseph and uh, when he came on staff. And then I remember when he came to me and said, Brother Tom, uh, looks like the Lord's opening me a door. I said, well, go talk to the preacher. Go tell him. And uh, brother, brother Chris has opportunities all over South Metro Atlanta in the high schools. He's going to kind of share some of that and preach to us. And it's a joy to have someone out of our church preaching young people out there in the world. 
And I told him long ago, I said, you'll have opportunities that I never get. When we were passing out pencils that first time at Jonesboro High School, I said, Chris, you're going to have way more opportunities than I'll ever have to reach these young people, and he is. And I thank God for him. You uh, make Brother Chris welcome. Thank you. I love you. Well, good evening. It is good to be here tonight. Uh, it has been a while since I have been in a room, and I've got the chance to talk to all adults. Uh, most of what I'm talking to are teenagers, um, hard-headed teenagers, some who don't even know God. And so uh, I, sometimes I have to shift gears uh, and, and realize where I'm at. So if I slip up and say something that I would say to a group of teen boys uh, in a locker room, I apologize. But no, I am uh, excited to be here tonight. Uh, before I dive into our message tonight, I'm going to share a little bit about our FCA ministry uh, I still have people that come up to me, they, they still don't really know what I do, uh, but the easiest way to put it is that I'm a missionary to the public schools, uh, we just use uh, sports as a platform, our actual mission, uh, it says on paper, is to lead every coach and athlete into a growing relationship with Christ and his church. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about the word influence, and we understand that on our public school campuses, coaches and athletes are the most influential people on our campuses. And so if we have coaches that are saved, that understand uh, what, what their calling is as a coach, and they're, they're pouring the word of God into their campuses, you have students that are, are huddling, and, and uh, you know every, every group's going to have their group that's getting together and pushing their agenda. But if we have students that are pushing uh, Christianity and pushing uh, their faith, uh, there in the public school. I can't do that, but they can. And so the more that we have that in our schools, the more influential they will be in our schools and more so in our community. And so what I did this past year is I went, because uh, I can get up here, I can share a lot of stuff about what's going on, and I'll, I'll share some numbers in a minute. Uh, but what I did this past year, towards the end of last year, I went around all of our campuses. I oversee Henry County, Butts County, and Newton County. So I have 14 high schools, we have a lot of middle schools as well as travel, community sports. If you know anything about club and travel sports, volleyball, soccer, baseball, it's starting to take over the sports world. And so we're also doing a lot in that realm with a lot of travel organizations. But uh, I, I figured that it was easy for me to get up and share about some things of how FCAs have an impact in our schools here in Henry County. But I put this video together. They're going to show you a six minute video. Uh, and this, this uh, video consists of coaches, uh, the Henry County Athletic Director, different people that are working in the schools as teachers and coaches uh, and sharing their perspective about FCA and some things that are taking place. The FCA is important because that's how we get a chance to tell these people, these young men, the most important thing in their life is going to be when they, uh, you know, find Jesus. And that's what I told them. That, that was the most important thing in my life when I was an athlete was finding Jesus. And so I hope that that's their experience one day. And that's what FCA is able to do. So FCA in schools is, uh, is a great avenue to get the unchurched um, in front of uh, God's Word and the message um, that can be provided through character education um, that is faith-based. To be honest with you, I've seen a difference since we started FCA and just the growth of our um, morning and afternoon FCA huddles. Uh, I've also seen a big difference in our kids looking forward to the character building sessions that uh, take place at practices and prior to games. So just having that presence on campus, uh, the kids being able to see uh, that not only the coach, but the administration and the athletic director are bought into what FCA does and what it brings to our school and our community uh, has really made a big difference. I think it's a really good like group of people and they really like bring athletes closer to God through fellowship and friendship. They came and did our pregame talks every Friday, as well as you know stopping by uh, practices and being there for us. They really enjoyed uh, hearing uh, you know, FCA's Mr. Watson, uh, Mr. Chris Watson, come every week and give such uh, great messages in terms of not not only great messages but great stories, and then connected to the Bible. And then as time went on, 
um, you know, I started to, you know, go to high school and go to college and got introduced to FCA, where FCA was kind of that extra support and resource for um, the things that were bigger than football. Um, and so, you know, I always told myself when I first got into coaching, um, I always want to make sure that I keep the, the most important thing at the forefront, and that's developing young men. SCA was, I miss SCA. We had a lot of fun over the summer. We got to compete. Uh, we also got to bond as a team. And not only did we get to bond as a team, but it also taught us a lot of things. I definitely feel like I learned a lot of things going to SCA. And, you know, it, I feel like it helped me throughout our season. They're directly impacting young people in our community. It 100% gives back immediately to students in our community who, you know, couldn't afford to go to any other camp, couldn't afford to go to any camp at all, maybe, um, and through the financial support of SCA, I mean, we have directly benefited uh, from that. We've had girls, you know, our, some of our players be able to go to camp who wouldn't have been able to go. And <clears throat> yeah, they're, they're learning volleyball, they're building team, but then they're also hearing the gospel, maybe for some of them for the first time. Um, and that's, that's huge. I mean, that's you know, directly, you know, giving back and investing in the young people in our community. I love to give the FCA. I've been doing it for many years because I love to see the real impact that they have in the schools. Um, working at Chick-fil-A, we've always been a big supporter in uh, local schools, uh, high schools, middle schools, even elementary schools. Um, I've known Chris for a long, long time, and um, he went to college with him. Uh, so he's always, uh, I know his heart, and I know he... Uh, his, the impact he makes, and I know he works tirelessly um, for the impact of, of, of the gospel on these schools, and I'm um, just very uh, excited to see what the work he's doing, and just want to continue to support him and help him achieve his goals and help to continue to influence this generation that's coming up. The FCA is very beneficial to us student-athletes just due to the fact that it connects, you know, very inspirational words to the Bible. And more specifically, uh, Mr. Chris Watson comes by and speaks to us. He, he does a really good job for the games, just prepping us with very motivational quotes that he also connects to the Bible and reward situation that we may face throughout the game. The wonderful thing about the, the FCA programming and the character coaches is their ability to get to know the kids. And they don't just come in and do sessions with the kids, which they do, and those are impactful, and, and they're a, a wonderful means and avenue of getting in front of kids. But when you look up at your game and you see on the sidelines a Chris Watson or a Mike Roby, um, and you see those guys that are out there and pouring in um, on a Friday night or on a Tuesday or whenever, um, that's true accountability, and that's that's true investment that those kids see and that may be the only recognizable adult that they see at their game they may look up into the stands and not see a single soul that is there to see them so it, it goes well beyond that huddle time that character uh, session that a, a fca representative character coach has with that team it's so much more it's the relationships they build you know an organization that that could step into <clears throat> young people's lives we'll talk about something that is life changing uh, and I know there's a lot of organizations out there doing good but this particular organization is giving them something that will change their life forever all right so that's just uh, that's just a little glimpse um, all of those coaches uh, were from right here in Henry County. Uh, my English uh, friend there uh, played professional soccer in England. He is now the soccer coach at Woodland High School. Um, Starkbridge was represented in that. Woodland was represented. Uh, Henry County's athletic director who oversees all of the county uh, was the lady that was speaking uh, in there as well. And so that's, again, just a small glimpse of what we're able to do uh, and, and really, it's, it's all God, the doors that he's opened. Um, it's nothing that, that I've done, anything special about me. Uh, I, have, I have one uh, key thing that I, I emphasize, and it's called the ministry of presence. Uh, I learned this, uh, Brother Tom referenced Jonesboro. We, uh, several years ago when I was on staff, that's how it all started. 
uh, we started going down here to the high school just to ask them if they needed some help and they needed uh, more help than we realized and so we started passing out pencils and paper and then it uh, uh, included being a part of the school council and then getting involved and providing food for the teachers and one thing led to another and 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 you started to see opportunities of need and to me that's what ministry is ministry uh, as me and brother Barry have talked about before on Wednesday nights it's it's one life touching another life for the gospel's sake and um, and so we started to see opportunities and and she referenced it in that video but I couldn't uh, tell you what I felt the night I was at Jonesboro Senior Night, and um, if you've ever been to a senior night for any sport, you know, they're, they're going to have a special time where they recognize those seniors, and you had kids that were walking across that field with their parents, and they had balloons, and they had special shirts made, and, and you know, they had this whole entourage of people that were coming with them, but then there was multiple kids, not just one, but a whole group of kids that as they walked across the field and they called their name and their achievements and, and where they were going, uh, after college or after high school and there was nobody walking with them but their head football coach and so I asked the assistant coach I said hey why does this guy why, why, why doesn't he have any family like where's mom where's dad where's the grandparents where's the aunts and uncles at least and they said that kid doesn't have any family he lives at his friend's house and comes to school with him no mom no dad and so it's real easy at that time, it was real easy, you know, to see all the division in the world and to see all the chaos and all the expectations that, that, that churches or individuals put on young people and say they ought to act like this and they ought to be like this and they ought to do this. But then I started to realize they had nobody teaching them to do that or be that. And that's when God started to put it on my heart that, hey, there's a whole mission field out there. And that's what we tell people. I have a lot of churches that reach out to me from other areas. They're like, hey, I want to get involved in the schools. And they know FCA is in the schools. And so I'll meet with different people. And they ask them, how do I get them to our church? I was like, well, if, if your job is to get them to your church and that's all you're trying to do, you're, in the, you're talking to the wrong person. Because it's no different than going to the prisons that the moment that you step out of your church campus, and the moment we step out of these doors and we step into that hallway, we've now stepped into a mission field. And so we have to take the gospel to them, and that's what we're all about. Uh, I'll give you a couple numbers here. Um, <clears throat> I, I looked it up. Uh, we run, obviously, parallel with the school year. A lot of people think that I am off during the summer. I am not off during the summer. Uh, you heard uh, a couple football players reference summer camps in there. Uh, the guy with the beard was... Um, Eagles Landing's volleyball coach. Uh, volleyball goes to camps. We have a softball volleyball camp coming up this summer. We have two sessions of football camp. We'll have about 1,000 to 1,500 kids at each camp out at the University of West Georgia. I have the privilege to serve at that. Also, I uh, serve as the assistant director to help run that camp and what it looks like and have a lot of input on how that camp's going to function and then what it looks like for when those kids go back to their campuses and how how are we working with them on their campuses? And Dutchtown High School came last year. They'll be back this summer. Uh, and, and those of you that support me and get my emails, you understand that uh, you know we, we raise money and we talk about our camps. That's, that's the kind of teams that you help. Uh, those of you that raise money for camps, volleyball is going. We have a cheerleading group from Locust Grove that goes to a FCA camp where they're going to hear the gospel. Uh, and then we also have here, uh, I'll have my second one this year, a baseball camp. Most of you know that we're baseball people and we're very connected to our baseball community in South Metro. And so I was looking over um, all of the huddles from, uh, from the time school started, which was in August or end of July, up until now. And uh, across our 14 high schools, we've had 68 huddles uh, across all of our schools. So that counts the morning huddles where they meet once a week. Uh, that also counts, for example, I'm currently working with two baseball teams. One of them just ended because they're out of the playoffs, so they're done. Uh, football huddles, volleyball huddles, cheerleading huddle, any, any type of sport you can think of, we have huddles with. Um, and so uh, 68 of those, that's where somebody's meeting with that team, meeting with those coaches every week and pouring into them from the Word of God. They're, they're doing devotionals, they're, uh, they're praying with those kids, they're having con gospel conversations with those kids. We did have several kids from Dutchtown made professions of faith at football camp. Uh, we were able to do some little 
uh, version Bible studies with some of those kids. I shared this with a Sunday school class a while back that one of those kids reached out to me not long ago through Instagram, and he messaged me and said, hey, coach, I got a question. Uh, am I allowed to repent again? And, um, and so I had to have a conversation with him and find out what he was talking about, but basically he realized uh, he was doing something he shouldn't have been doing, and he wanted to know how to make it right. And so I was able to take him to First John and walk him through what, you know, our Christian relationship looks like. And so that's just a glimpse of some of the opportunities that we have and some of the conversations we get to have. We also just started our second middle school huddle. Some of you guys may have seen a post this week that I made uh, at Henderson Middle School at Jackson. The huddle is only about five weeks old. I had a coach reach out to me uh, that goes to a local Baptist church, and he said, hey, I want to get involved here. I want to have impact on these students, and so we went and met uh, two weeks into it. They had nine kids, and then this past week, uh, they had over 100, uh, and all they bring is donuts. Normally, if you bring biscuits, they all show up, but they're just bringing donuts, and it's seeming to work, and so they're sharing the gospel every week with over 100 kids at the middle school level, and hopefully, that's going to pour over into Jackson High School as well. So uh, I appreciate all of you that support us and that... Uh, that just check up on us, always ask about how things are going. And if you don't get our email uh, newsletters and things that we that we send out, feel free to see me after church, and I will make sure to get you on our email list, okay? So I want to uh, share tonight, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 2. I've been praying about what I wanted to share because it has been a while, and, and you know, I, I probably have a whole list of stuff that I could share and preach from, and those of you that preach understand that sometimes you're kind of, you know, battling between what direction to go. But as Brother Joe was closing this morning, he started challenging us and he, he used this word influence. And he talked about how we have influence on our families and uh, sometimes we may not live outside of the walls of the church the way we need to, to have uh, that consistent influence. And I knew immediately uh, where God wanted me to go. Uh, and so Galatians chapter 2 tonight. We're going to begin reading in verse number 11 down to verse 14, uh, and we'll share and try to be a help to you tonight. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11 says this, <clears throat> But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them, which were of the circumcision, talking about the Jews. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity, first and foremost, just to be, uh, be here, to be awake today. Uh, thank you for waking me up this morning. We thank you for the very breath that is in our body. And Lord, we just ask you for the next few moments that, Lord, as I always ask, that, Lord, you would just kind of put me out of the way and that, Lord, somebody here would hear your voice speaking to them, that they would hear something louder uh, and more audible than my voice. And Lord, would you help them help challenge all of our hearts tonight, uh, search our hearts, Lord, and help us to identify where we are with you. Lord, if there's anybody here that does not know you, I pray that, Lord, through this, that, Lord, you would help them to see the love that you have for them and the gift that you've given them. And Lord, I just pray that you'd help all of us to be challenged and encouraged from your word tonight. We thank you for it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So what I want to share tonight it's just real simple. I want to talk about the inconsistency in our influence. The inconsistency in our influence. And I know it's probably based off the title, it's not going to be one of those loud, you know, everybody jumping around and, and loving the message kind of sermon, but I believe it's needed. Uh, and I, I believe that because the way this morning's message was closed about the importance of our influence, the importance of our influence in our family, the importance of our influence and the people we work with, the people at the local coffee shop, the people that we, uh, that we deal with at restaurants, I believe that our influence is important. It is important to have influence. And what we have here in this story is the Apostle Paul talking about 
a time where he had to challenge Simon Peter face to face. Now, we know nobody's perfect. Simon Peter is one of those who's had some hardships. He's not always made the best decisions. And so what happened, they're down in Antioch, which was an area that had both Jews that had been converted to Christianity. There was also Gentiles that had been ver converted to Christianity. And so that church had a lot of Gentile believers in it. And Simon Peter, who is a pillar, he's a leader uh, in this Christianity movement. He was down there hanging out with the Gentiles, which is perfectly okay because they're all a part of the same family now. But then it says that James sent certain Jews down to Antioch, and when Simon Peter saw these Jews coming who were supposed to be Christian Jews, they were converted, when he saw them, he withdrew himself from the Gentiles to go and be with the Jews. And when the Apostle Paul saw it, he called him out about it and said, hey, you're not being consistent according to the gospel. You're not walking up rightly according to the truth of the gospel. And he called him out for not being consistent in his influence. And so I want to dive into some things using that uh, as our text. And influence is this, the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone else. Most of the time when we hear this word influence, we talk about young people, right? We, we challenge young people, be careful who you allow to influence you. We, we challenge them, be careful what you listen to, what you watch. But it is so much greater than that because the adults, we have to do the same thing. We have to be careful who we're around. We have to be careful uh, what we listen to, what we see, who we allow to be a part of our lives because influence uh, is coming from all directions. Let me give you... A few different things. Number one, the truth about influence. Let's talk about that for a moment. The truth about influence. Number one, everybody has influence. Now, I could look around this room, and we could probably do a survey and talk about the introverted people, and we could talk about the extroverted people, right? If you know me, you know I'm more of the talker of the family. I'm the one that, that does a lot of the talking. I don't mind. I'm up here right now, right? I don't mind uh, being uh, a... a involved in conversations and most of the time i'm the one that is always being drugged because it's like hey stop talking because we have to go and that happens to me on a daily basis so i love what i get to do for a living because i'm always talking some people prefer to be quiet right they're more introverted they're more keep their thoughts internally and so what i've learned though whether you're introverted whether you're extroverted whether you're quiet whether you're outgoing everybody has influence whether you're young or you're the oldest person in this room you have influence it may not be on the same group of people that I have influence on but you have influence it might be your classmates you might be a stay-at-home mom and have influence on your kids but then you also have influence on the people in the Walmart pickup or wherever it is that you go during the day everybody has influence and that's a truth that we need to learn no matter if I'm quiet no matter if I'm shy no matter if I'm outgoing we all have influence there's a quote that says this all human beings wield influence a powerful sword granted at birth wield your sword with care everybody has influence number two everybody is influenced by someone or something in our text Simon Peter was influenced by James and certain Jews I like how it says certain ones we all know who those are right there were certain Jews who came to town and it affected Simon Peter everybody is influenced by something there's people in your life right now whether you realize it or not they're influencing you the TV shows the music the the circle that you keep on a daily basis your 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 social network those people that you involve yourself with on a daily basis whether you realize it or not are influencing you if you've got negative people in your circle it's going to influence you if you have positive people in your circle it's going to influence you everybody has influence but everybody is also influenced by someone or something thirdly notice this your influence has influence now when I say that that doesn't really make a lot of sense your influence has influence but look at verse 13 when you see what Simon Peter did he withdrew himself in verse 12 but look at verse 13 and the other Jews 
dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. So Simon Peter made the decision that, hey, I'm going to withdraw myself, play the role of a hypocrite. So then he affected these Jews, and these Jews in so much that Barnabas, who was a leader, was also carried away. Our influence has influence. The people that you are influencing are influencing others. By the way, isn't that what discipleship is supposed to be? That as we pour into them, they're supposed to be pouring into other people. But too many times we have people that we're pouring negativity into them, or we're pouring just religion into them, or we're pouring certain things into them, and then that's being poured into other people. So we got to be careful how consistent we are in our influence. Because what we're pouring into people, they're pouring into somebody else. What we're pouring into our kids, they're pouring into other kids at school. What we pour into our families, they're pouring into people they work with. What we pour into people that we know, they're pouring into other people. In so much that a leader was carried away with their hypocrisy. Number two, the gospel should be at the core of our influence. The gospel should be at the core of our influence. Everything we do should center around the gospel. I love church. I love Christianity. I love America. I love the flag. I love all of those things. But everything that I do should center around the gospel. I'm a Christian before I'm an American, right? I'm a Christian before I get into politics. I'm a Christian before I get into what sports team you like, right? Christianity should center around the gospel. It should be at the core of our influence. Notice verse 14, what he says here. This is what bothered the Apostle Paul. He says, but when I saw that they walk not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. That's when he confronted Simon Peter. They did not walk uprightly according to the gospel. That word means that they were not in step with. They were not in sync with the gospel. They said one thing, but did another thing. And too many times, that's kind of what we dealt with this morning as we were closing out, that there's too many people who claim on their Facebook profile to say Christian, but their life says so much more. Their life says otherwise. We have bumper stickers, and uh, I see so much. I, it, man, I see students do it all the time. They, they put up the verse of the day off the Bible app because you can just share it automatically, and then they'll share things right after that are very opposite of what they just shared. But you know what? If we're honest, we do that same thing too. By the things we say, the way we act, our attitude, our, our fruits of the Spirit that we've just learned about, how many times we fail in those areas, and yet we claim to be certain things, but it's real easy to get away from the gospel being the center of who we are, the center of how we see people, the center of of every our worldview should should go through the gospel because notice what he says here he didn't say they didn't walk uprightly according to the gospel he said they didn't walk uprightly to the truth of the gospel and here's what that is the gospel is the death the burial and resurrection correct he said they didn't walk according to the truth of that and here's what that meant the truth of it was that he did that for every person because that's what the topic of the issue was, that, that you had these Jews over here who followed the law, and they, they followed certain rituals, and they had to eat a certain way, and they were better than everybody else because they kept the law. But when Jesus came, he broke down that middle wall and took the division away and said, hey, all the ground is level now, right? And so that's what they had been teaching, and that's why there were Gentile believers in the church who were once called dogs, they're now in the same church worshiping and serving the same God. But then all of a sudden, you have a group of certain Jews who are walking over here and says, no, I can't associate with them. There's no room for prejudice in the gospel. There's no room for hate in the gospel. 
it's real easy to say, man, you know what? I can't associate with these people over here. They have these views or they vote this way or they look this way or they act this way. And I see so much of it. But you have to ask yourself this question, and it points back to the gospel. Did Jesus die for that individual? The answer is always going to be yes. And so when you ask yourself that question, did Jesus die for that individual, that individual now becomes important. But too many times we see people, based off of their outward appearance or based off of the way they, say, the, the way they speak or the things they say, the stuff they put online, and we think, oh, I don't, I don't want anything to do with them. But it's really hard, as Brother Perry used to say, uh, I, used to, I used to go to jail with him. I picked up a lot of sayings, but um, when we would serve at Fulton County, to jail, we didn't go to jail together. I didn't, didn't mean to say that, but uh, he would always say, if you're going to fish, you got to go where the water's wet, right? Never made sense to me, but, I mean, it sounds easy enough. If we're going to reach lost people, we have to be in more than just here. You see, Ephesians 4 teaches that the church is for the believers to grow and be perfected so that you can come here and mature. The reason you come here is not just for social hour, but you come here not just to check a box so that you can grow and walk out these doors better for the work of the ministry. The Great Commission, which is out there. The Great Commission doesn't start in here. It starts out there because of what your heart, how your heart is being uh, developed and matured in here. Does that make sense? And so when we go out there, we can't just say, oh, I gotta, gotta just hang out with people that look like me and, and, and act like me and, and run in my little circle, right? Because where's our influence? We have to have influence. The Great Commission said to go into all the world. And so what, what I do is I walk into some pretty sketchy places <laughs> some days. Uh, I could tell you story after story of things I've seen in the hallways, things I've, uh, just uh, last, last year I went to Alcove High School in Newton County, and there was a uh, marijuana smell coming from the bathroom in the school. Like it's different when it's the neighborhood next to the school, but it was actually in the school. And so the guy, the coach I had to meet with had to stop and get the principal and the resource officer, and they had to go deal with it, right? Because we all knew what was happening. I don't know why, you know, teenagers are dumb. I'm sorry, but... We, we all smell it, right? But our influence should center around the gospel. The gospel is for everybody. Every man, woman, boy and girl. Every color, every creed, every political platform, every view, every different identity. Jesus died for every person. Now we can get into what's right and what's wrong. But, it, but Jesus, when he was criticized for who he was eating with, right, in Matthew's house, he said, by the way, I came because there's some people that aren't whole. Right? And so too many times I think we look at people and we want them to, to be a certain thing that they're not because they're not whole. They don't know what we know. They don't have the light the way that we have the light. And so we cannot ask them to live up to something that they don't know. The gospel should be at the core of our influence. Lastly, your influence should be aligned with your identity. Your influence should be aligned with your identity. In other words, be what you say you are. Be what you say you are. This is where we left off this morning. He called out Simon Peter and said, you're not being what you're supposed to be. That word dissimulation is literally, it means to play the hypocrite. In verse number 13, it says, And the Jews dissembled likewise. In other words, they started to follow his hypocrisy. They too became hypocrites, insomuch that Barnabas, a leader, was then carried away with their hypocrisy, with their dissimulation. And the word hypocrite was a, it comes from a word that meant stage actor. In other words, somebody that took on a role and, and got on a stage and performed and pretended to be something that they're not. And too many times in religious circles and too many times in churches, we have people that have that title by their name. But when we leave here, our influence is everything but that. Our influence does not align with our identity, what we claim to be. 
We're stage actors. There's been times in my life I've claimed, oh, I love the whole world, but then I get aggravated, right? And I don't show that person that I love the whole world. I don't show that person that Jesus died for them. I don't, I don't show that because I'm aggravated, right, because of whatever issues I'm dealing with. And so sometimes if we're not careful, we can be hypocrites. And we've all heard it. We probably all know right now somebody in your life or in your circle that you've tried to witness to or you've tried to talk to and have conversations with and say, hey, why don't you go to church? Why don't you do this? And, and everybody's got a reason. Well, there's too many hypocrites or I was hurt by somebody. Or, and those are real issues. Those are real things that have happened. I know a lot of those. I have a lot of conversations with students. Uh, back over uh, Thanksgiving break, we had a student. Most of y'all probably saw the, the new, uh, news story here. There was an incident over Thanksgiving break where uh, they, the girl was a junior at Dutchtown, but uh, the incident happened in Clayton County. The father took her life and then took his own life during Thanksgiving break. And so I was at school that Monday at Dutchtown because at that time I was working with their football team. Um, and so I was in there with all the counselors talking to the students. And I heard a student come in talking to one of the social workers, one of the counselors, and she said this. She said, I'm tired of people telling me they're praying for me because I don't even think God's real anymore because if he was, why would he let that happen? People were telling her they're praying for her, and she said, I'm tired of hearing it. That's a reality of what is around us. That's a reality of what we run into sometimes because so many people have encountered people that their influence doesn't line up with their identity. They claim to be a preacher. They claim to be a pastor. They claim to be a, you know, a leader in the church. They claim to be a teacher. They claim to be somebody that they can trust. They claim to be somebody that they can look up to. They claim to be somebody that they can trust and, and have a relationship with or whatever. And that influence doesn't line up with them. And too many people have experienced hurt and experience hypocrisy. So let me give you these things and then we'll be finished. So I wrote down three things, how to be consistent in our influence. Like we can talk all day about being inconsistent, but how, how do we make sure that when we leave here, we're consistent? Number one is be real, just be authentic. I read a survey one time that was talking about youth ministry and, and, and uh, students of our day. And I don't know if you ever studied generations. I'm a millennial, don't judge me for the rest of us. But then there was Gen Z, and, and a lot of people think that Gen Z is this group here, but this is like Alpha Gen. Y'all are a whole new group of weird that come in. But when you study generations and, and how different things go, um, they say that what, what is it that, that young people want? It's not the music. It's not, not the show. It's not the, the activities and events. They want, they want authenticity. They want something real because too many people have people that don't follow their promises, too many people that have walked out on them in their life, too many different issues, and they just want authenticity. And so what I challenge people to do, just be real. Don't have to be anything that we, you know, I, you'll never hear me get up and claim to be something because I know what I am. On my worst days, I know exactly what I am, and I'm not going to get up here and pretend that I'm something that I'm not because then I would be a stage actor. And there's a quote that I read one time. It says, people are impressed with your successes, but they identify with your failures. And so what I've learned, if I'm in a room full of 30-something young men and they're all from different backgrounds, sometimes I'll open up about something that I struggle with. For me, it's my temper. You know, I got two kids that don't listen, right? And so I'll, I'll be honest with them. Like, hey, I'm not perfect. I struggle well, then it starts to build some trust because now they're like, okay, he's not coming in here to tell us how great he is, right? He's not coming in to tell us, you know, we got to do this or else, right? Just be real. People around you, people in your job, people in your community, people at Walmart, they're just looking for something real. No filters, no fake, no phony, just real. Secondly is be relational. Be relational. 
Take time to be intentional and invest in the relationships that God has put in your life. Because again, there's people in your circle of influence that God has put you there for a reason. It might be at work. It might be in your neighborhood. It might be at school. It might be uh, somewhere that you go every week. Chick-fil-A, the Mexican restaurant, right? We all know where we go. Starbucks, the coffee shop. Whatever you do, you have a circle of influence. When's the last time you asked them something about themselves? Where are they at in life? You see, a lot of times we, we want to just share the gospel immediately, and that's great. I think we should. But a lot of times we don't even take time to get to know who they are. And we always heard the saying, they don't care what we know until we know how much we care. When's the last time you asked that person what their name was? What, you know, what's their week been like? Because a lot of times you ask people, they'll tell you. And you'll find real quick, they're going through some stuff. Just this season, I've got a base, one baseball team I'm working with. And just this season, this is my third season with them. <clears throat> to start the season, we had um, a community travel coach uh, that a lot of them used to play for when they were younger. He overdosed on drugs several months ago. Uh, not long after that, one of the seniors, uh, outfielder, he had an older brother that was dealing with some depression and, and some, uh, some addictions and, and things like that, came home, committed suicide in front of their mom. They had that funeral. And then not long after that, just a few weeks ago, one of the other seniors, uh, his grandfather, who was always at the games, passed away of a heart attack. And then right after that, that young man, who we've been trying our best to keep on the right path, just turned 19, going to graduate next month, and he'll be a dad in the next five months. We don't know what people are going through. And so it's real easy to lay out a whole list of rules and things and say, hey, man, here's what they should be doing in these schools. But the reality is when you take time to sit down and talk to them, there's stuff going on. So be real, but then be relational. Be intentional in building relationships and people around you so that we can influence them for the gospel. And then thirdly, it's be ready. Be ready, because you never know when that opportunity is going to come to share the gospel. I tell people all the time that uh, the reason I go into some of these schools and I meet a coach and I can tell really quick that he's not a pastor, right? He doesn't, you know, based off of his language and things that he says, he's probably not the strongest believer I've ever met. And so my job is to get in there to be an influence, though, right? And so I say, Coach, let me just teach leadership. Let me teach character. And I tell people, I explain it like this, that when you give a baby medicine, sometimes you got to put it in some applesauce. And so character development, that's my applesauce, that I go in and then I start to build relationships. And then next thing you know, we get to have these conversations where a kid comes up and has a question about something going on in his life or, you know, why is his mom battling cancer or whatever the case is. We get a lot of conversations. So be ready because as you build those relationships, as your influence in your circle at work or whatever it is, those conversations, something's going to come out of that. And it might be that, man, I don't understand why the world is the way it is. Well, let's talk about sin, right? There's always opportunities that are going to come about. So be real, but be ready. Be ready for that moment where we're going to get to share the gospel because we've got to be consistent in our influence if we're going to make a difference for the gospel. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity just to uh, stand up here and share your word. And uh, Lord, I pray if there was at least one person uh, that was helped, that was challenged, I pray that you'd help us all to look at the faces in our mind of the people that you've put in our circle people that that we see on a daily basis that that lord we have influence on i pray that you would help us uh challenge our hearts and uh, lord just thank you again for what you're going to do in christ's name amen can we stand together i want my wife to play a verse of jesus keep me